so Senate Government Operations, it is Thursday, um, May 13th. We have had a little difficult technical difficulty getting started here, but rest assured, we have been doing nothing businesslike. The only thing we've done is try to figure out how to get ourselves hooked up and um, going. So committee, Michael Sherling will be joining us at two. He couldn't make it any earlier. Oh. We might even be done by two. <laughs> Tony Fakos, you always look like you're on a golf course with all this green behind you. Laying down. Company rules. This is our official background. What, what does it say? It's the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Oh, yeah, I see. You have to kind of get up close to see it. Really? I've seen Michelle Boomhauer without that background. I've seen Joan Flynn without that background. How interesting. It's, it's, it, was, it came from Michelle. She doesn't use it. <laughs> Just saying. Hey, I'm, st I'm, you know, I've been here 10 months. I'm still the new, the new kid on the block here. So, uh, you know, I just do as I'm told. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe it's a hazing thing, you know, it's Zoom hazing. There we go. You <laughs> so, um, I know, I don't know who all is going to be with us today. And Tony, I, um, I'm happy to see you. Um, what, what I did was I scheduled this because I had, I didn't want to leave this completely hanging. And I think it's important in my mind anyway, to assure people that, um, my plan for the committee is that we go forward with this. Clearly, it isn't going to happen this year. And um, I apologize for that. We got caught up with a bunch of other things. I think that we got off to a kind of a rocky start without a bill. And I should have been more attentive to that and make sure that we had um, a bill clearly at the beginning. And um, but I, I feel it's important to go forward with this issue. And I just wanted to get a sense from people if, if they felt the same and um, from committee members and also from the people out there in the field. Um, so I suspect that the commissioner won't be with us, as he said, until two o'clock. And I suspect that he would feel it important to go forward, but I, I won't speak for him, but... Um, so committee members, are you, um, where are you? I'm, I'm fine well, with the uh, procedure you just outlined, Madam Chair. I think we could spend a good part of the afternoon fine tuning what we have and uh, look forward to uh, getting it drafted in January. Yeah, I would agree. I've, I've been, I'm somewhat a skeptic. I started out as a skeptic of this whole process, but I think we've actually made some good progress in this conversation over the last couple of weeks or months, whatever it's been, <laughs> weeks, months, years. It seems like we've been, I've been sitting on this couch forever, but I, mean, I think we've made some good progress. And so I'm, I'm willing to continue to move forward on it. Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would echo Anthony's uh, comments. I think that we have made good progress and it's beginning to take shape. And I think actually it does it solves a lot of administrative. Um, I, I don't know what the quite the right word is, but it, I think it streamlines things. I think it improves things. Actually, once we finish, get through to the other end, I think it's going to be a big improvement. And um, I think we can address some of the concerns that have been raised. And I, I think this is a positive step forward for public safety, co combining uh, and bringing under one umbrella a lot of these uh, areas that address and are our professional public safety arms, divisions. Senator Rahm, do you feel you- Yeah, I hope you- Yeah, okay. I'm just I'm hands-free and um, 
I echo Senator Polina's comments as well. Um, I would just hope that over the time away, the commissioner could further document the feedback that they received um, in their public process around modernization and how they incorporated that into this proposal because I, I just still don't feel like I have a sense of how they really listened to the people who they engaged in the public participation process. Okay, yep. And I think that um, the, the comments that they received were uh, addressed more than just the reorganization of the um, department into an agency, but we can ask him to um, have that more information for us when we come back in January on that. Okay, so I'm going to um, ask Cindy and uh, Tony where they, what they're feeling on this is whether we go forward. It sounds like the committee wants to, wants to move forward. Don't. Tony, do you want to go first, or you're muted? You're Tony. muted, though. Okay. My computer's going a little slow today. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think um, you know we're definitely hearing the the concerns here, as you know, Chair Sorrell has mentioned about uh, you know roles, and I think the the coming year will really help our council kind of solidify mission and direction and things and that, you know, we'll be in a much better place for conversations about this type of work a year from now than we are right now. So I think it's good, you know, from our perspective, it helps us and the new council sort of get a more solid footing for, for future conversations. So good, good for my end. Okay, good. Thank you. Tony. Sure. Uh, Tony Fakus, Executive Director for Department of, uh, for the Division of Enforcement and Safety, Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, yeah, I mean, is I th Madam Chair, as you know, I've always, even from the municipal side, been very supportive of regional efforts. I think it is absolutely the future of public safety. Um, that being said, the, and I'm, I'm basing off the last draft that Amarin did, I think the 2.4. Is that? Yeah, I think that's the last one we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm still cautiously optimistic at this point, but I want to be make be absolutely clear that uh, um, you know I think there's a lot of opportunity and work to still be done. Uh, I need to have several conversations I think with Commissioner Sherling. Uh, right now, one of the things though that's kind of glaring to me in this current draft, anyway, just to flag it for everybody, um, something that's the, some of the frustration and the concern that my team has. And we've got about 30% of our sworn personnel came from the Vermont State Police. So, I mean, there's very various reasons um, that they are here and they're very concerned about not being, um, you know, if, if, for example, if VSP is short somewhere, could they, their jobs totally change and can they be pulled from one division to the other? That was something that was in the original executive order that Commissioner Sherling and I were really careful to make sure that we appropriately uh, had some, you know, uh, I hate using the term silo in a negative sense, but we, you know, but we were, you know, those, those, those boundaries were there so that we could maintain our special expertise within motor vehicle enforcement. But at the same time, you know, VSP has, you know, what, what they do. And uh, the current draft is kind of contradictory. Uh, if you look at page uh, six, it just makes reference um, that the how they uh, would be um, you know if, uh, under under uh, you know the very first part under B uh, you know should not be assigned transferred outside their division unless the member requests a transfer and the commissioner approves the transfer and then when you go to page seven under permissive duties it makes clear that the commissioner may with the approval of the secretary transfer classified positions within and between divisions subject to the state. Uh, personnel laws and rules, so forth. So anyway, that that certainly was of great concern to my team. Um, and, um, you know, I just want to make sure that I, you know, I, I've, I also don't want to have a mutiny on my hands. I want to make sure that they understand that, you know, they're not just going to be, um, you know, we're, you know, not being moved around um, based on what one particular department needs. 
because the other thing is, uh, you know, and we're clear eyed that um, in a crisis, in any major challenge, we, we will always pitch in. I mean, two of our investigators, for example, sworn personnel, both from a detect, one of our detectives and one of our, uh, you know, uniform sergeants were assigned to the Department of Health for contact tracing and provided their expertise to the Department of Health. I mean, so uh, we are committed as always to serving Vermonters and supporting, um, you know, our, all of our, uh, you know, fellow law enforcement agencies. So that's, so that kind of language, those are some of the details anyway, that I want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're absolutely are clear on. Um, and I've also already testified and I've been very consistent with the, I, I think, um, I think what the underpinning of a Bureau of, of Professional Standards, uh, one of the advantages that's, that's, that's laid out in the very beginning of this is that it streamlines uh, policy, for example, when, there, when, a, when a policy change needs to be implemented, um, you know, it's going to be real time for any law enforcement entity within this agency. The other thing I, I just, for the sake of discussion, um, you know, the last testimony, uh, you know, VSP has SPAC, they have that advisory support. Um, and without doing anything to dilute the success of the Vermont State Police and, the, you know, from including their CALEA accreditation. Uh, but I'd like to see opportunities of value added to the motor vehicle department as well in terms of um, training, you know, professional opportunity support as well as internal affairs and accountability. Um, and so it just seems like, um, you know, where's, where's that specific in this language anyway, how do we add that value to how we operate? Uh, because I think the bottom line is the public expects, you know, regardless of the uniform and the specialty, whether it's a, you know, a warden or a, a motor vehicle inspector, you know, certain standards, if, if they are a sworn law enforcement officer, certain standards must be consistent throughout. And I think that's a great opportunity as, as we look at police reform and everything that we're doing. Um, and it makes us more nimble as an overall agency in that construct. But in the meantime, you know, I, I just want to make sure, um, and I know uh, uh, our union representative is not, not on, the, on this, this call right now or this hearing, but um, th that's really their, their concern as well. So I want to make sure that, you know, we, we um, absolutely are cautious, build this right, because this is a big opportunity, for, I think, for the state of Vermont to improve public safety, but it has to make sure that it adds value to every entity that comes on board. So, yes, Senator Calmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Tony, I, I think you're right. Um, when you read the two different pieces of language regarding, um, you know, getting switched back and forth between divisions, it does seem like there's some confusion there, at least maybe not confusion, but lack of clarity, perhaps. So I do think we probably need to take a look at that. Would you be okay with the ability of someone to move if the employee and let's just say a supervisory person both agreed that that's what they wanted to happen? Absolutely, that was in the, uh, the mechanics of even the original executive order. Um, you know, they would still, the, the, the employee would have to you know, make that request to transition. And then, of course, it needs to, would need to be approved based on those operational needs of each, each division under that, under that department. And I take your other point well, too, that um, the training and the potential for advancement and that sort of thing, um, I think it should mirror what we have for the, uh, the VSP. And uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. So it, it might be, um, if I can suggest that um, over the the break before we come back in January that uh, you might work with the commissioner around the language, particularly on page seven there, that just seems to contradict what the other language says and see if we can come up with some language that that makes it clear that that there can, in time of crisis or something, that they there will be uh, cross-pollinization, but that it, it won't be willy-nilly just capricious uh, transfers, because that does sound like it could be here, just the secretary and the commissioner making the switch. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I think a lot of that too is language we can probably re, you know, um, revitalize from part of the original executive order, um, that 68 page document um, where we 
we uh, did kind of spell that out initially, but your point's well taken, Madam Chair. And and I also, in terms of what um, Senator Colomar was saying around the um, making sure that um, that there's value added to the DMV positions and how that making it kind of the equivalent of the VSP, how if there's language that should be in here around how to how to achieve that, I mean, we can't in in um, statutes. We don't get so detailed about everything. Right. But if if it's if it's something that should could be in here that would make it clear and then established by rule or something. Yeah, I mean, my point was not so much to like, for example, a lieutenant here at Motor Vehicle has a very different mission from a lieutenant in the mm -hmm. Vermont State Police, uh, especially mm -hmm. when I think about a station, you know, a station commander. Um, and I'm not looking for necessarily, you know, equality there no. in terms of that. But what I am thinking about, though, more broadly is um, as you look at professional standards, you know, the training component opportunities that um, you know, to, to get really the, to, to maximize the, you know, the intent and expected outcome of an agency that would have those opportunities, as well as the accountability piece. Um, as I've said in previous testimony, for example, the inter internal affairs process um, for accountability is very different for anybody outside the Vermont State Police that's still sworn, whether you're Fish and Wildlife or Department of Liquor Control uh, or any of our folks. And I think, again, I'm, I'm trying, I'd like to see, um, you know, is, is to get to that, that consistency um, as well. And, and um, so that's what I meant by, by that. You know, whether that model, I mean, I've bounced off some ideas with the commissioner, um, Commissioner Sherling on, on some of my vision on what that could look like, uh, where you know, there's, there's a, you know, absolute um, buy-in from both, both divisions um, to support something along the lines of, again, a, a um, a bureau, if you will, for example, of professional standards, um, you know, that's not specific within either, either division, but above both divisions, but under the, under the, this, what would become the commissioner of the department of law enforcement as an example of what I mean by that. Any other questions or comments for Tony or in general? Um, I had a, um, a conversation with a sheriff um, one day about, because this, this really only, this doesn't um, impact at all our municipal departments or our county sheriffs or our constables, be, because this is just really an or reorganization at the state level. But, but um, we, were wondering if there's, if somehow the, uh, under this, I think the commissioner called it division of support services. If the support services that are there that are intended for the other sworn law enforcement officers could also be extended to the sheriffs and some small um, municipal departments that just don't have the capability of, of uh, doing all that, like grant writing and um, personnel work and um, all of those things. I, I have no idea if that's even possible, but I think it might be something that we can uh, explore over the, the summer to find out if it's even possible at all. Allison, Senator Clarkson? No, Allison's fine. I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a really, worthy thing to, to research because once this becomes an agency, it, be, it, it has the possibility of becoming really a resource for all of law enforcement and all of public safety. And, uh, and, and we don't necessarily know how that might look 10 years from now, but it, I think it would be an interesting avenue to explore, particularly as we really have been wanting to regionalize a lot of these services for a whole host of reasons. Um, and I, it, no, I think that would be a great, a great thing to explore. And I'm not, I'm not sure how you would do it, but I, I think that right now within the department, um, which would still be within the agency, the um, 
emergency management does provide um, assistance and support to local emergency management people and, and fire safety does <coughs> the same, but we yeah. haven't done that with law enforcement. So I, I, I just don't know how that could work, but and, well, I think it's, it, it, I, I would agree because it also begins to get at <laughs> reducing the sort of the patchwork problem, the, and, 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 and maybe creates a framework for coordination in a more consistent way. Yeah. And if you, and if you think about it, you have, if you have a small department, a small department or a, a sheriff's office with few employees, if, if they each have to duplicate all of those administrative services, that's a lot of inefficiencies yep. and a lot of, um, I, I don't know if it would work or not at all, but it's, it's something that I've been thinking about and have had some conversations with some sheriffs. And yeah, Senator Polina? I think, I think it's a good thought. Yep. <laughs> I do. No, I, I do. I think providing resources to the local communities that have little for, little police forces at all, it's really could be really helpful. I mean, even just around hiring somebody, how do you go about hiring? How do you look? How do you review resumes? What do you look for? How do you just um, because well, I think being made being made aware of state and federal money that's available. Like yeah. you said, writing grants. I mean, that could be really helpful. We did a little bit of that, it's different but similar in agriculture where we assigned these grant writers to work with farmers in local communities around the state who don't have the resources to write their own grants. And it's generated like a huge amount of money for those communities that they wouldn't have gotten if it wasn't for the help they got in terms of faci facilitating the grant preparations. That's an interest that's interesting, yeah. Huh. So the other thing I have been um, mulling around in my head a lot is this report that was put out by the auditor. And I don't know exactly what to do with it because it, in my mind, it's, um, and I like our auditor a lot and I think he does wonderful things, but in my mind, this is a very, is, um, uh, Many people associate public safety with um, law enforcement. And this report on the local and state spending on public safety lumps in everything. It lumps in all of the judiciary and all of the sheriffs and the defender general and the state's attorneys, court diversion, 911, the uh, just the training, the Crim Justice Council, Cr Criminal Justice Council, uh, Woodside Victim Services, it's all in here under public safety, but it gives the impression that we are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on public safety when in fact, if you break it down, what's being spent on actual law enforcement is very little compared to that whole so I, I just, I don't know what to do with this, but I know that it's out there and that people have commented on it. So does anybody have any suggestions about where we might, or should we just ignore it? I, I, I don't think we want to ignore it. I, um, I, I, I think it would be helpful to clarify what we consider public safety and that we don't actually consider, I mean, I don't consider all any of the court, I think of the judicial branch as being very different. I mean, ha it, it would be interesting for us to actually define for state government. I mean, I'm sure we have it in the statute somewhere where public safety is defined. I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but I think that would be helpful because yeah. otherwise you're gonna have reports like this where he drew in unnecessarily, I think. Uh, whole areas that that um, I'm not sure are under that umbrella. So and corrections is in there also. Yeah, and so I uh, I think that that bears further discussion, which is really clarifying as we look at the agency, clarifying what we consider public safety. 
Senator Colmore, I saw you had your hand up. I did. Um, Senator Clexon spoke pretty much to my point. I, what I would suggest is whether um, the auditor wants to do it or someone that has the report and can kind of divide up, you know, how much is spent on judicial matters, how much is spent with corrections and, and get a fair number for what is, is public safety and law enforcement. Because I agree with you. I think the, the number is probably swollen to a point where it looks it looks much bigger than it really is. I actually have done that. Oh, well. And I mean, it is, it kind of is in here broken down. And uh, like there's $162 million by cities and towns. But again, it lumps in their, their law enforcement, their emergency planning, their EMS systems, if they operate their own ambulances, all of that. And the Department of Public Safety itself is $109 million. And that is more than just law enforcement. I mean, I think we need to, my concern is that um, there has been concern about the, the making the agency that it's creating a super police agency, which I, I think it's actually doing the opposite. But um, I, I think we need to be very clear about what is spent on uh, law enforcement so that we can look at that. It, it just law enforcement itself. So anyway, that's just a, I, I don't know what to, how to approach this. If we, uh, I'll, um, I'll send out some figures to everybody before then so that we can, actually look at it but so yeah i'll do that i don't know what else to do with this report except to just well one thing one thing yeah we, go ahead one thing go we, ahead. yeah uh, one thing we could do is actually ask the auditor to streamline the report and have him their office uh, focus and maybe pull out the areas we consider public safety as we look to actually define public safety in the creation of this agency, uh, which I think it, it should be part and parcel of that work. And, and that if he was willing to actually pull out and do a, 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 a an, an edit or a, a draft two of his report, which just uh, pulled out the areas we consider part of public safety, which you've done. It sounds like you've done that work. And yeah. if areas he feels that as we go into this work of establishing an agency, if there are areas he feels we need to pay particular attention to as we go through that process, I think that would be valuable. But um, I think we need to streamline it so that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. So maybe what, um, because he does the way, here's his definition of public safety. The efforts of any government agency, department or subunit whose mission relates directly to ensuring the safety and security of Vermont residents. Well, but that's entire state government. I mean, I think that's our <laughs> primary purpose. Well, Is that's how he defines it. I'll send out some of these numbers here um, so that we can just have a better sense of what we're talking about because I, I just don't want people to think that um, by, when I, I'm linking, linking this with the creation of the agency, I don't want people to look at the creation of what um, some people think of as a super police agency and then look at this um, auditor's report that says we spend $574 million on public safety the, and, and use that as um, uh, fodder for the discussion. Yeah, to, I mean, yeah. To be fair, I don't consider the public defender to have anything, well, it might have something to do with public safety, but right? Let me put it the other way. When I think of public safety, I'm not thinking of the public defender. So maybe, maybe a way of doing it is to um, look at the agency. If we were to create an agency, how much of this money it would be assigned to the 
from the two, the different departments, the Vermont State Police, Department of Motor Vehicles, Home um, Emergency Management, Fire Safety, and do it that way so that we can actually see how it relates to the creation of an agency. I think that makes sense. That would be great. Yeah. All right, let, I'll, I'll work on that. Any other um, specific comments on where we were with the with the um, bill? I don't. Uh, they canceled it. Oh, okay. What, um, what are we uh, calling the bill at the moment? It, 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 is it Amarin? Is it under Amarin's name? Yes, and it's draft request twenty one zero eight nine zero. And what I, what I think makes sense is to have, if Tony can work on some language here and anybody else who has concerns about specific language, Cindy, if the uh, council has specific language concerns or anything is try to get it together and um, we'll get it to Amarin and then we'll um, introduce it as a bill so that when we come back in January, there's an actual bill with a number, but we've worked out a lot of the issues can before we, make, we actually get the bill. Can we make it a committee bill? We, we, we can, yeah. um, but I, if we make it a committee bill, we won't have a bill for people to respond to until, oh. until we get back. Because we, I'm not sure if we're ready with this draft to make it a committee bill. Um, and so what I, what I, when we can all or any of us can sponsor it, but I think it, I think we need to have something in bill form for people to respond to in January. I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Makes sense. That makes sense because then we have something for people to respond. Yes, to, we have a, a, a foundation for discussion. Yeah. Because it's been so fluid that it's hard for people, I think, to to comment on it and make comments and stuff. And I've had a, a bunch of meetings in my community with people. And um, most people have said they support the concept and support the idea of making it a, truly a public safety agency instead of a... The, the Department of Public Safety is so... Um, kind of associated with the troopers that it's hard for people to get past that. So what I've heard in my community is that people support the reorganization. They just don't know the details yet. So I think that would be helpful. I agree. Uh, okay. All right. So do we want to go spend more time going through the bill? Um, does anybody have other specific issues that they would like um, to have worked on over the summer fall and I will be happy to work with them. Well, I just appreciated um, Mr. Fakus's uh, articulation of a department of professional standards or some kind of um, quality oversight entity that sits above all of the other divisions. And I think it could do a lot around justice oversight and inclusion. Isn't that what the council, the role of the council? I think to some extent, um, but I, you know, I, I haven't yet heard that the council has direct supervisory power. So they might hear something when it becomes an issue or when someone's being trained to become a police officer, but there's a lot of other time and space in between before something rises to the level of investigation that I think requires ongoing supervisory work. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how that, well, we'll have to think about that because I'm not sure, I don't know, Tony, what you were referring to. Were you referring to some kind of a, a board that had that oversaw professional standards other than the council or how what were you yeah i know commissioner shirley's now on the on the uh oh good screen as well um 
it, you know, my thought was simply an expansion of, um, you know, the Office of Professional Standards that they have within the Vermont State Police, and the commissioner can speak more to that. I was looking at more in the in the context of broadening that entity, so it would have direct ability to, um, it would, it would, you know, for example, um, tracking the training and providing training priorities and goals that would be that would be where their universal training needs, um, regardless of the specialty of the law enforcement function, but also the internal affairs process. So again, uh, anybody that that is with under the Department of Law Enforcement would be held to a certain standard. Um, does not mean that we would all necessarily have the same. I mean, again, we would have some different policy for motor vehicle that are specific to commercial vehicle enforcement, for example. Um, but on the issues that we're really faced with anybody that is a sworn law enforcement officer, um, those standards, there has to be a direct mechanism, I think, to um, not only provide the training and the support mechanisms, but also the, the accountability piece. And it's, and it, and it, and it's uh, just like the internal affairs process. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned what municipalities are doing. I do know that the chiefs are working hard um, to come up with a way to, to develop capacity to handle internal affairs. They're trying to get a pool of investigators around the state that have gone to specialized training on how to conduct internal investigations. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of pieces to that. And um, so everybody's trying to you know, get to, I think, the same place. And I just, it's only my idea was a, a thought of how do we do that that would support, for example, the motor vehicle enforcement um, division, you know, again, not to do anything that would dilute Vermont State Police, but how do we enhance it for any other division that falls within the, under the commissioner of law, of law enforcement? So maybe... Sorry. Maybe, um, let me just uh, think this out. Maybe that one of the support services under the Division of Support Services is some kind of an internal investigations um, uh, or something, and that uh, we just need to make sure that it uh, uh, cooperates or coordinates with the council so that we're, up, but that would, then maybe be able to provide the same kind of uh, support to the municipal PDs who are looking for some kind of support and um, uh, commonality and how to how to do it without each having to have their own. Um, I don't know. So, Co Commissioner Sherling, I'm glad you joined us, and um, I apologize for not, um, for it being May 13th and we're still here. Um, but what I wanted to do today was to find out from the committee and from others, it was my feeling that we should go forward with this bill and have a bill in January that is as well thought out as possible and has all as many kinks worked out as possible so that we can actually Move, move it relatively quickly in January. And so what we're doing today is just kind of thinking of what might need to go into the bill to have it as ready as possible. And um, Tony has suggested a couple areas where he and you are going to work on some language. And, and then we started talking about, um, I had mentioned that I've talked to a couple sheriffs that, um, we're, we, we were just playing with the idea of under the division of support services that you have in here, is there, can sheriffs um, and maybe even municipal PDs contract with the agency under the division of support services to receive some of those support services that they themselves can't uh, supply because it's very inefficient for everybody to have their own grant writer or human resources person or whatever it is. So then, then we got into the conversation of um, internal investigations and how that, how that might work. Um, so that's where we are. Got it. Um, thanks for having me back. Uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of uh, Public Safety. Um, I should check in and just make sure you can't hear the chainsaw that's outside. Okay, Can't perfect. 
Um, the uh, we would be open uh, to a discussion of providing additional support services to other uh, organizations. Um, I would suggest that it, it probably makes sense to do that in an iterative fashion and not try to put that into the first version of mm -hmm. uh, if an agency were to come to fruition next year, uh, to put it in immediately, just because we wouldn't want to overcomplicate uh, transitions and make sure we could mm -hmm. spend the requisite time um, ensuring that the few components we've contemplated initially are, uh, are brought together effectively. Um, I did listen in on uh, just in the last few minutes on the discussion of uh, uh, both professional standards and internal affairs. Uh, so the committee is aware uh, in statute, you created uh, many decades ago, uh, a very distinct split where um, the Office of Internal Affairs reports directly to me outside the chain of command of the state police and then reports directly to the State Police Advisory Commission. Um, that's done very intentionally. Um, there could be advantages to expanding the scope of that office and potentially even of uh, SPAC. I don't want to speak on their behalf because they are an independent um, entity. Um, but it would be an interesting exploration to expand uh, the scope of SPAC's work. Uh, I would stop short of saying that that would work um, outside of state government, but it would be an interesting exploration to look at um, SPAC being uh, uh, a piece of the puzzle for the other state law enforcement entities that uh, are contemplated to come into the agency either initially or potentially uh, in the future. Um, and using that internal affairs investigatory model in the same fashion where it, it is uh, very specifically independent of the command structure of um, those organizations uh, and reports to the, uh, in this case, the commissioner, in the case of an agency, the, the secretary directly. Um, the, I, I will flag on the, the uh, conversation around um, internal affairs and municipal departments and sheriffs. Um, that gets quite uh, a bit more complicated uh, in, uh, in part because they have different, uh, they're different governmental structures and uh, are completely independent of the state and um, have different rules and, and regulations in many instances. And on key topics, we're moving toward having uh, universal uh, rules and policies, but uh, there are differences based on municipal regulations, municipal charters, et cetera. So that's probably not um, at, at this point in the evolution, something that works. Um, but the chief, I will flag for you that the chiefs uh, and sheriffs have put forth a framework in response to our 10 point plan uh, that we put forward last year. They came up with a framework that is ready to be uh, explored on improving uh, and making more independent um, internal investigations to then report back through the government structures that they would be working for, uh, whether it be a sheriff's office or a municipal government or, um, or whatever the case may be. It's just important to note that there are elected officials. In the case of a sheriff, they're the elected official. In the case of municipalities, there are uh, there's seven mayors, there are select boards, and uh, in some cases, in many cases, there are appointed town managers that have um, oversight. And so, so it's really the investigative component mm -hmm. um, that needs the consistency. And, and then uh, the oversight is done by whoever the elected officials are in those particular uh, jurisdictions. Um, uh, just flag one other thing for you, which is the relationship between, and I'll talk specifically about the state police, uh, the relationship between Internal Affairs, the State Police Advisory Commission, and the Criminal Justice Council, which you have uh, over the years uh, given more, more and more responsibility, I think um, rightfully so, and, and a well-designed uh, system to um, do, uh, sorry, I'm a little distracted by the noise. I'm glad you can't hear it, but it's interrupting my thought process just a touch. Um, the... Uh, 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 professional standards and certifications. So the importance of that is that not only do you have a track to hold officers and, and personnel in general accountable through an internal affairs process relative to the rules, but there's a parallel process relative to certification, decertification to, uh, and accountability. Um, and the relationship there is that 
for the state police in particular, um, the Office of Internal Affairs um, r regularly, as necessary, reports um, any violations of rules, any findings that I make and SPAC upholds to um, the Criminal Justice Council for um, certification action. And that's, that's how those two things are uh, connected and those parallel processes um, work. I'll stop there. Uh, that's good. And I think that Cindy spoke earlier about how um, in a year they will be in a much better position to, to kind of weigh in on the, the details of what we're talking about and how, how all this relationship works. And um, they, we acknowledge that they only really got going in January right. with this new, new um, structure. So and I, I just to um, go back when you were talking about the um, that there's different um, because of the different kind of municipalities and sheriffs and stuff. But what I was thinking of was just the investigative um, part of it. That because um, Tony mentioned that uh, the a number of the chiefs were trying to figure out how to maybe hire a pool of investigators that they could draw on um, it, and, and I was thinking maybe that pool of investigators is the same pool of investigators that is used by your, by the agency, but it was just a thought. Yes, yeah. I, I think and, that model um, has, um, has efficacy, uh, that, that shared model where you're, it, one of the most important components is, uh, well, there's, there's two that stand out. One is having folks that are trained in internal affairs specifically. So it's not just whoever you happen to have available picking off the mm -hmm. shelf um, because there are legal issues and there are, are nuances to those investigations that are different than criminal uh, investigations. Although the same skill sets apply uh, and overlap in, in much of the, uh, much of the case, um, it, they're not entirely overlapping. The other is that uh, ensuring that whoever is doing the investigations has no pre-existing relationship with the person being investigated. And you know th that's pretty easy that they're not friends or haven't worked together. Um, it's, it becomes a little harder when you're trying to get complete detachment. They've never done a case together. They've never had to back each other up. And that pool uh, statewide pool with regions uh, to pull from is, uh, I think, a great model to be able to do that, where people are completely disconnected, have may have heard a name, but have never met this person before, um, and uh, can go uh, do an independent investigation without, I, I should be really clear, without the perception that there is a, an issue, um, even in smaller organizations that I have been uh, a part of. It, the fact that people know each other does not typically play into a uh, um, an internal investigation. Uh, I, I've said this repeatedly, and I, I've heard just about every chief in Vermont and elsewhere say this, we are our own worst critics. When something goes badly, um, we tend to actually go a little overboard uh, in terms of what we think uh, the, the repercussions should be. So tempering that is sometimes important. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Um, Commissioner, would you, would you also agree that it's not ideal for the person to have been part of the department or agency um, being investigated? It depends on the circumstances. Uh, you know, in the case of the state police, there's the 300 troopers spread across the state in 212 towns and 10 barracks. It, you achieve the same goal um, by having uh, being able to assign a captain from southern Vermont who's never met a trooper from northern Vermont. Um, uh, and I would think the same uh, could apply even in a smaller organization like uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles. In Burlington, for example, we would assign folks that were in different divisions. And there are generational differences between folks. So you can get detachment um, in many instances. It does become more and more difficult when you're in a very small PD and, and everyone's working together. So I, I think there's an advantage both to the the perception of the independence of the investigation, but also uh, we shouldn't discount the, 
uh, importance of not putting other employees in a difficult position to have to investigate when you when you only have five people and you know twenty percent of the the departments investigating another twenty percent of the department. Um, it, it, that gets, like I said, much easier when you get to uh, a larger organization where there are distinct differences in divisions and geography. Um, so my the, the more simplistic answer is it depends, uh, but in some instances you, you are uh, you are right, Senator. <laughs> a small state, it's um, hard to get independence from around anything. Um, I, I will just, I'm going to call on Senator Colmore, but I, many, many years ago, um, my car broke down on 91 right near Randolph and I got it down to Randolph and they were working on it. And I w decided to go have lunch while I was waiting and I was sitting there and I did not know a soul in Randolph. This was years ago. And I just, and this guy walked in and said, oh, I know you. He happened to be the town manager of Randolph and I was on the community development board. And I, I said, oh my God, you've got to be careful wherever you go in this state. So anyway, Senator Colomer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I want to step outside the investigative, investigative um, world for just a second. Um, the commissioner mentioned you know, many govern different governmental kind of structures with regard to our law enforcement um, community. But I think to the average Vermonter, there's got to be a pretty common perception of what our professional standards are, regardless of whether you're a sheriff or a constable or a Vermont State Police officer or a local PD. And I'm just wondering how different that governmental structure is really in the end, um, you know, in, in the eyes of, of, of what we might consider a typical citizen. No, that's a that's a great uh, question, Senator, and thank you for allowing me to clarify. It really, it, what I'm speaking to is really more the process than than anything. Um, the uh, the code of conduct for law enforcement is uh, is pretty well galvanized. Uh, it's actually called the code of conduct. Um, the general rules are generally pr are pretty well galvanized. Um, individual operating policies do differ based on. Uh, geography, uh, resources, et cetera. So for example, the policies that the state police have do differ um, in, in a number of ways from the policies that I wrote when I was in Burlington because the urban, I say that with a little U, it's as urban as we get. The urban operating environment is quite <laughs> different than the rural operating environment that the state police operate in. And as a result, the policies and procedures that govern that, those operations are different. What I was really talking about was that there's a, a municipal human resource process that's been established. Those do differ in terms of flow based on a variety of different factors. And, and that's what we have to be deferential to um, on that, in that particular lane of travel relative to um, adherence to policy and procedure and the, the rules of that uh, particular government entity that the agency uh, operates under. The advantage to what's been developed in recent years in professional standards is, in addition to that, there are universal professional standards right. that the Criminal Justice Council has. So even if um, something doesn't pass muster for uh, being a, a terminable offense in a municipality or in the state, it is conceivable that at a state level relative to certification, you have deemed that that is something that should be decertified and you have a parallel track to do that. I also want to just for the record mention that I think um, Senator White is, is correct. In many people's eyes, the Vermont State Police equal law enforcement in, in Vermont to a great degree. I think that's what people think of when they think of that. And I think at one time it might have been true that the uh, Vermont State Police officers were the quote most professional of all of the law enforcement that we had. I'm not sure that's true anymore. I know many municipal law enforcement officers, local PD, sheriffs uh, that get an equal amount of uh, good training and that do very good work and, um, and act as sort of just another um, piece of law enforcement, if you will. So just for the record, I 
I appreciate the work that, that all of law enforcement does uh, in the state. I appreciate that, Senator. I, I think you're right. I, I've watched for the last 30 years as the uh, level of professionalism has increased exponentially. Some of the people that I, were, I was hired with um, originally had never been to a police academy. It didn't exist when they came on board. Um, that is no longer um, the case, but it wasn't that long ago that there were still people um, in the profession who didn't have the benefit of training because it hadn't been developed yet. Um, so uh, I, I think that's right. And I think uh, in Vermont, we, we do lose sight of this among all the challenges we have that Vermont is very fortunate to have uh, a very high level of professionalism, high level of training, um, well-run uh, police academy and uh, knock on wood, you know, relative to, to many other places that are less fortunate than us um, are in, in pretty good shape. Lots, lots of work to do. Um, but I would put up, I would put our folks against uh, just about anybody in the country in terms of uh, capacity, professionalism, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And did you know that, um, this is just an aside, but did you know that um, you don't have to be a certified law enforcement officer to be a sheriff? Anybody, I could run for sheriff if I wanted to. Yes. Yes, I did know that. Um, yeah. It used to be you didn't have to be an attorney to be a, a state's attorney that, that you fixed that. <laughs> we fixed that. that we that, fixed that, but that. we haven't fixed the sheriff yet. Are we able to fix that or is that it? That's not constitutional what its requirements are. No, and I don't know that it there probably wouldn't be many instances where a non law enforcement person would run for sheriff anyway, because they it would. Um, it would surface so fast. Well, no, what would happen is that they could only do the administrative parts of the job. They'd have to hire somebody to do the law enforcement parts. They, so yeah. they're not gonna like that because that means they have two positions sharing one budget, I mean, one, one salary. So I don't think that's likely to happen. Well, and also they, they get stuck doing the paperwork and instead of the grunt work instead of actually having the fun of being law enforcement. <laughs> right. They don't get to ride in a car with a bubble on the top. Right. <laughs> Tony, uh, what were you doing there? You're muted, Tony. Still doing it. <laughs> My apologies. I was just talking to the commissioner real quick on something. The other commissioner. No, it's fine. I, I just thought it was pretty funny. Um, anybody else have... So my, here's, here's what I'm gonna suggest. <clears throat> we look at this bill. We, uh, we've asked Tony and the commissioner to work on a couple parts here. We'll ask the council to look at um, their parts in here. Do we need to add something, take something away, change something? Um, and, um, if there are other issues that come up and then I will work with Amron. Oh, and commissioner, if you want to work with Amron also um, over the, until Jan, you know, to get, make sure that we have uh, something by January. And then and when Amron gets it into some kind of shape that isn't final, but is presentable, then I'll um, see if anybody else on the committee wants to co-sponsor. And we'll have a bill by the first day when we come back in January. That sounds great. Um, unless there's an objection, I think we'll, the starting point would be the committee's last draft and, and yeah. we'll work from there. Yeah, and there were a couple things in here that Tony brought up that just to make some clarifications in the language and um, and go, we'll go through it and see what other, uh, changes. I don't know if we ever changed our uh, the name of our what I had suggested unfortunately as a community relations uh, office and the suggestion that I've heard from my constituents is community engagement and I don't know if that's in here or not but we'll make sure that that gets in here with 
some language. Right. Okay. Thank you all. Well, I am, I'm going to apologize for um, my, uh, what turned out to be in this case, my lack of planning skills and not getting this done earlier. But I think that we're in a much better place than if we had tried to pass something earlier. I think that um, we're, we're end up with much more support. In the grand timeline of the Agency of Public Safety discussion, the last five months is a drop in the 51 year bucket. <laughs> I was gonna say exactly that. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank I, you. And Thank unless you anybody much. else has anything they're dying to say, I think, uh, can the committee stay on for just a little while? Sure. Sure. Thank you, Cindy, Tony.